There's actually surprisingly been a compression in range the last few weeks. I shouldn't say surprisingly, but we have been in range. There's been a lot of chop. And when markets get choppy, I tend to um, I, I tend to pull back a little bit. I, I was sort of teasing a little bit on um, YouTube, um, sorry, on Twitter, about us being in a peekaboo style market. <laughs> and I guess I was inspired by the Mayweather Pacquiao fight, although neither one of them really used that style. And the style I refer to is peeping your fists up by your face, elbows blocking the body, and you wait for your moment and then you pounce. So it's basically staying small, staying compressed, and then waiting for your shot to really to like knock the other guy out. And in this case, that being stocks. So the market has been very responsive to technical analysis lately. And as it usually is, the time frame of the traders that have been involved in the market are clearly in the day time frame and not so much the, um, the larger institutions. Although there are some signs of them in the market on close, which I often discuss MOC. So basically what I'm seeing is for about a month straight, the market on close orders have been massively skewed to the sell side. And that just means that the amount of people who have market on close orders are on balance sellers rather than buyers. When they're buyers, I've been affectionately referring to them as dollar menu, meaning it's been sub $100 million. And on the days that they're selling, they're multiple hundreds of millions of dollars. So in and to itself, I don't know how actionable this is for the day-to-day -day person. But for me, the trend of it is, has been that the larger money has been sellers on balance into rallies for sure. And the way I use it for the most part is if I have an order I need to get off into the close it'll kind of let me know which way the wind is blowing. For example, if there's 500 million to buy, I know that there's sort of a, um, a wind at my back, so to speak, as opposed to if there's a uh, half a billion dollars to sell, which I know I'm sort of sailing into, into, choppy, into choppy weather. So that's sort of the backdrop. And when, when markets get like this, when they get really choppy, the way I like to trade back to the, uh, the peekaboo style is that I like to keep my position size smaller. I like to use smaller time frames, meaning that I'm not in positions for longer durations, particularly with options. If I'm short premium, it, it has to be near dated premium. And I look for smaller swings. So for example, if I was looking for 10 points, maybe I'm gonna pull that back to five or seven or look to scale into those numbers a little bit more soon than I might normally. So for example, with like, let's say a stock like Gilead, um, on, a, on a rising tape, I might be looking to add over 105 or 108 as opposed to sell into those numbers in some type of a choppy sideways market. Now, the way I'm most comfortable, at least for me for trading, is I like to buy stocks in a rising tape and sell stocks into a falling tape, meaning short sell. And I haven't seen the line of least resistance yet define itself, and I've been saying this for the last few weeks, that we are in this chop we sideways balance and there really is no is really no direction so i would say that being choppy there are two ways to look at this being choppy at the top there are the theory is that you don't have this long to sell the highs and that the market should go higher or the other philosophy is that there are no new money buyers and if momentum, particularly in a market, can it, ca cannot continue higher, it's just going to completely sell off. My take on that is I don't know either way which way it's going to go. Uh, there have been some troubling signs, like I said, with the market on close orders being to the sell side. I also, the, there has been a bit of a decline in the breath, meaning the stocks that are advancing versus declining is deteriorating some. And you can also see some faltering in some of the market leaders, such as Apple and Facebook and Google. And particularly, that is important for the NASDAQ, Apple and Google, that is. You also want to take a look at the, the semiconductors, for example. Those are very important, too, the SOX. There's been a little bit of weakness and compression in there, although I wouldn't say it's fallen off of a cliff just yet. The real key, I think, in the litmus test that the, um, litmus test 
that the media likes to use is IWM. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the key level with IWM, and you could kind of use this as your uh, sort of keep it in your back pocket, is if the if it's over 120.97, it's still kind of healthy. Anything below there gets a little bit more iffy. We are currently above there, although we're sort of just in a bit of a choppy range and in danger of now making a lower high. The one thing that I have liked, and I, I will say it, that it ha this sort of the um, has the Apple and these stocks have going for it is they u they've been using up a lot of the time that they have in their cycles to go down. So you, if you, and this is very evident by the stochastic momentum. You can see Apple isn't quite below the lower lines, but it's getting there. Facebook is well below, and it's right into like sort of the pocket of support. So that's sort of my, my thinking right now at the market, and that's why I'm sort of staying huddled and sort of punching when I, when I see opportunities as opposed to carrying larger positions on a trending market. It's really important to know what kind of market you're in. Something that's been bothering me that I've been seeing on the stream, and I, I don't want to single anyone out, but there is sort of a lot of lip service being paid toward risk management. And I guess in this type of a market, that's been okay because the, the Fed sort of has our back. And the market is very forgiving. If, it go, if something goes down, it can come back. But if the market does turn, and I'm not saying that it has yet or that it will anytime soon, I would be really cautious because you know, what was a three-point loss can become a 30-point loss very quickly, um, particularly if we do f f you know, transition into a bear market. And that's sort of the, um, the, the, the concern here. It's not that markets go from being bullish to bearish right away. There's often a transition point, and I often tell this to people when I'm, when I'm discussing the markets or even just life in general, that you don't just go from wrong to, be, to, to right to wrong or wrong to right. There's a subtle transition in between. So in order to become wrong, you have to first stop becoming right, and in order to become right, you have to first stop being wrong. So I think that the market is in danger of that type of a transition here, although I haven't seen any type of a confirmation to put it that way. And I will say the, um, the, the IV is really low, so if you're really long a lot of stocks here, you might want to lighten a little into rallies or buy some puts into the um, S&P, let's say the S&P 500 or IWM or any of these as hedges against longs. And I would say that the, um, when the IV is sort of at the lower end of the range, you can do so really cheaply, and it'll probably help you sleep a little bit at night. I mean, if you're really lo overly long or overly short ever, and you're having a hard time sleeping, you're overly committed and your mindset isn't into the money-making mindset. You're sort of into defensive mode. And I always like to be in opportunistic modes where I can take advantages of other people's pain, particularly when there's you know, a swift drop in something that may not be overdue or coming into technicals. If you're managing tons of losses, it's very hard to be in that now moment and take advantage of, of those opportunities. So that's really what I suggest. I suggest just not getting too ahead of your skis in either direction. We're coming into uh, you know, a seasonably tough time for stocks, whether that play plays out or not. Some summers it has, some summers it hasn't. Let's just wait and see how the range goes. And the range that I think is really key here for SPY is the one, I, I don't really play with my ranges that much unless I see some type of a tectonic shift like a, like a, a very swift advance or decline or something that happens in terms of the charts pattern-wise to change me. So the numbers I've been watching with SPY is 211.5, and the low end of that is the 209.33 down to 208.97. Anything above there, I still think the S&P and stocks are sort of in healthy, okay mode. If it starts getting below there, though, you really run the risk of retesting the 100-day moving average, which supported the last time. And I do believe any type of a snap of the 100-day moving average is going to start putting the 200-day moving average into play. That's currently down around 203. And there's also um, a, a major gap fill and an old high plus um, a major volume distribution around 201.90. I think that that area would be a great place for right or right out long in size if there is some type of a swift breakdown there. Um, of, a, of a deeper liquidation correction. 
again, as of now, not seeing that yet. You need to, I go by the levels. I ride by the levels, die by the levels, but I am just giving you guys the worst case scenario. You know, the media likes to make everyone very nervous, and the fear is always down because on balance, most people are always long. So I'm just sort of putting it into context and giving you of what, what could happen and what to be prepared for and where to be opportunistic. So that said, there, there is also the obvious possibility of upside. You don't hear that talked about much these days. A lot of worry warts and fear mongering, although I'll tell you, if there is a move up, it could be actually quite violent and it could be a type of blow off top. And if you do see something like that, you could significant, I mean, there could be a really significant move up. Although what I'm thinking in terms of a move up is it's going to be incremental, which isn't the best of news in terms of risk or reward. There are Fibonacci extensions, the, not to get too wonky with you guys, but anyone who follows me knows I use Fibonacci extent, retracements and extensions. And the 1.618 Fibonacci extension, depending on what time frame you use it on, I've been playing with it on a couple, takes you up to 213.40 to 214.17. And up there, I do think that there is an opportunity to um, probably lighten up some of the longs. Uh, if there is some type of a blow off, obviously those numbers aren't going to matter and it's just going to be a complete flush up. Although the character and the nature of the market hasn't been that. It's been these incremental higher highs and then pullbacks into the middle of range. So that's really where I would be looking to, to sell into if the market does you know, try to bu bubble up. That said, 100 MA is the key support. If we lose that, 200 MA. Keep it simple, stupid, right? I always say that. So with that, I, I've been doing a lot of talking. Maybe um, we should open the floor up to some questions. I did see um, one brave soul earlier mentioned Twitter, so let's discuss that here. Uh, my thinking on Twitter is that social media in general has been a little bit out of, not in vogue lately because of Twitter and because of things like Yelp and also because of stocks like, stocks like LinkedIn who have been smashed. That said, I think Twitter is going to do something like just chop around and build a base and be a little bit of dead money. The risk with Twitter in, in the short term is um, 3607 and 3462, where I do think you could be right or right out. I don't necessarily know if we get there, although it's possible. I do think you could kind of sort of nibble a little bit into Twitter. I am expecting it to get back up on some type of a rally at some point. I don't know when and how, but somewhere up to 44 to 40, 46, probably like 4450s or 4480s, like around that area. So let's say between 44, 45, I think that's where it could go to at some point. I don't know when or how that's going to happen, but I do think it, at some point it will. The um, problem for Twitter has been, yeah, we'll talk about the VIX in a sec. Why not? Uh, one of the things that I, I haven't liked about Twitter is that they haven't been able to report back to back two good quarters in a row. It's been sort of this choppy garbage. You know, they have one good one and then the next one is terrible. And I think that it's, it's not giving institutional investors or sort of bigger players the impetus to want to load up and put a portfolio in Twitter. They haven't really proved that they can monetize. If you recall Facebook when it came public, it basically went from 30A, which was the IPO, in an absolute straight line down to 19, where I actually turned on it and got bullish around 20. I was about a buck early. Um, I remember there was a lot of um, debate on that at the, on the stream at the time, and it turned out being it turned out being a really good call on my part. Not so, and that really wasn't, believe it or not, based so much on technicals because at the time the risk was to 16, and I was just thinking that the sentiment at the time was so bearish that it was just time to to kind of load up. And mind you, I had told everybody who would listen to me. Friends of mine, even on Facebook, who have nothing to do with stocks, who were asking me about uh, about Facebook, to stay away from that IPO that I thought it was going to be toxic and lower, and I had turned on it. Oddly, I am I am actually still pretty bullish on Facebook. Um, the problem really has been that it had been chased, and just the way this stock trades, it tends to trade in straight lines down and straight lines up. And as of now, it's sort of held what I see as the measured move support. The risk being 76, um, 96, and it, we kind of just tagged around there and um, and and reversed. And I would say that this area is really key. Uh, the one problem I am seeing with the stock is that I do believe somewhere between 80 and 81 is going to be a brick wall for a while, at least until they have some real new product development. 
or some earnings that can take the stock over. The stock has not reacted well on the earnings lately, although in between earnings cycles it tends to have these run-ups. Uh, my concern with that is the um, is just is just that that it's going to need some news to really break it out of a range. Anyone who's been following me for a while knows I think Facebook is going to go to 100. Guess what? I still think so. I just think it's going to take a little bit longer than I may have originally anticipated. I'm not going to back down on that just because the stock has gone lower and it's um, now hated by, well, I shouldn't say hated by everyone, although it's not loved on the stream as much as it was. It was liked a little bit too much. So the concerns for me with Facebook are the following. Um, what would invalidate the thesis? Where would I, where, what is the risk for lower? So the risk for lower is if we do break that last swing low, I do think that there would be some room down to the channel low, which is in the lower 76s. A snap of that, believe it or not, could take you to 75 or even 73.45, which was the real true range low. If the stock is healthy, and I believe it still is because it hasn't snapped, it should be holding here and building a base right here, right now, and going higher. It may not do it on the snap. It may, it may take till next week or what, at, what have you. It may chop for a while after that last earnings down. A couple of earnings ago, it, it took a few weeks of chop to resolve. I think that that's sort of just what's playing out, and I think that's just what's playing out in Twitter for a while. I think these stocks just got overcrowded, and they're sort of just resetting a little bit, getting out the weak hands, the chasers, and you know the market really hasn't been super duper strong. Sort of momentum stocks, and this is another tell of why I'm being very cautious here, is that when stocks report good earnings, like an Apple, they are not holding their gains. They have been chased and they're fully long. Everyone who's wanted to buy the stock is already in it, and they're sort of looking for the next you know, person to pay still higher for that. And that hasn't been materializing. On the contrary, when a stock goes down, if they miss, they have been absolutely slaughtered, like 15 or 25 percent or even worse in some cases. So that's why I've been really cautious around earnings and not really playing them as much, because the risk reward favors, you know, prudence. And there are better plays when they are, um, you know, after the move has already happened, so to speak, either for continuation lower or for some type of a move still higher if they, um, if they can hold. So someone had asked me about the VIX. VIX is really, I actually was quoted in an article. Uh, I'm going to post the link to that article in the description of, on this video in YouTube. And the, I could also tweet it out on the stream in Twitter if you guys, if you guys are interested. If you, if you are, um, let me know. Also, one thing about Periscope, guys, if you're interested in something I'm talking about, just tap the screen a little bit. Little hearts appear, and that sort of lets me know if you guys are interested in what I'm talking about. If I sort of don't see that many, I'm, I'm sort of just not sure what you guys are interested in or not. So I could sort of move on at that point. The meaning of right, right or right out. Um, that's a great question. Let's, take a, let's actually answer that before we get into the VIX because I talk about these terms and people don't seem to have a full grasp on that. So what does right or right out mean? It means like if we're at a 61.8 Fibonacci uh, retracement, you buy the retracement and either you're right or you're right out and you could give it like you know a buck or 50 cents or a quarter whatever you know if there's a reference low like let's say a hundred is a double bottom for a stock you know you buy that right or right out and if it gets to let's say slightly below there if you want to give it a dollar or what have you and you're wrong you're out very simple um, same thing with a short uh, let's say you're a stocks in a downtrend and you come up to the downtrend line you're right or right out against the downtrend line. It's sort of, um, there's a, a saying my buddy Brad on Shadow Trader uses, he calls it jumping from the basement window. So imagine, you rather than jumping from the roof of, 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 of an apartment building, you jump from the basement window. You're not going to get too badly hurt. So that's sort of the theory of right or right out. Um, BTD is just buy the dip. Um, and then there's always GTFO, which just means get the F out. You will often hear me say that if you're right or right out or GTFO, insert expletive. So the VIX, someone had asked about the VIX. So the VIX is at the lower end of range. And that sort of got me a little bit more cautious on the market. In 2007, you did see a low print in the VIX of 9. But in general, it's been tending to hold 
but ra roughly around this like 11, 12 area. And after that, there has been sort of sharp corrections where the VIX has spiked usually to about 17. I wouldn't be too concerned with the market until you really see it get past 1720 in the VIX. The, that was a double top, and since there we've been making lower highs and chopping. Uh, it's also a downtrend line, although we are now the downtrend line has now moved a little bit lower. It's about 15 and uh, sorry, 1640 if it were to 1635, 1640 if it were to happen tomorrow, which it could. I mean, you never know. I am sort of in the philosophy that volatility is just going to compress for a while until it doesn't and explodes. Anyone who's been following me on Twitter, I've been doing more debit spreads than I have in a really long time. When IV is low, like it is now, you can't really sell out of the money premium. I mean, the theory is you could do strangles because we've just been in a sideways choppy market, but I tend to not to like to sell volatility unless it's expensive, like when the VIX is 17 or 20 or 22 or 25. That's when it's great to sell some out of the money premium and you get some real juice for it. Because if you do get a reversal and there's some type of a bounce, you not only have price going in your direction, you have Vega and you have the IV decay, uh, or sorry, compression going in your way. And in many instances, that is better than price. I'm getting a ton of text messages here. Let me try and get rid of these. It's distracting. So the... The, the, so anyway, so not to get too divergent on that, let's stick to what, I, what I'm talking about. When IV is low like this, I favor directional play, meaning you long premiums as opposed to being shorted, which is sort of like almost like the cardinal sin if you're over in this household. I'm more of a premium seller than I'm a buyer. But when something is too low to sell, I, the, 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 the option is to do nothing or to be a buyer. So I believe that doing like spreads that are debit are the better way to go or if they're really near dated, I think the ratios are good as well. So, but on balance, you probably want to be long. I've been doing, you know, I did a um, Gilead long, I did a call spread, actually a risk reversal. I had sold some puts to buy a call spread, although I really could have just done the calls. I did the same thing in Visa where I bought a uh, call spread. That's just now right call spread. Um, someone just asked me about rig. So rig is finally, it looks like it's forming a bit of a rounded bottom, and I would say that the stock is probably, thanks for pointing this out, actually. Um, it's, not, it's one I had followed a while back and got stopped out of quite a long time ago, um, and rightfully so. My stops in that instance, risk management, saved me quite a bit of money. Uh, it wound up being a a bit of a loser, but nothing catastrophic like it would have been if I had held it. So it looks like a bit of a rounded top, I'm sorry, a rounded bottom to me. I would say that the worst in oil is probably over. Um, if you recall, I happen to be the guy who called the bottom in oil and also the guy who sort of called the bottom in the euro. Um, all of that is time stamped in real time if you want to go back on my Twitter stream. There actually had been a, um, a TD bet um, that people were asked that, that the question had been posed, not if the euro is going to reach parity, but when. And my bet was that it won't reach parity. And this is roughly when it was $1.05, I think, $1.03, or roughly around there. I had drawn a channel low and said that that's where it would hold. And I did some type of, um, ex I did some analysis on oil, which I had said that the 200 week moving average roughly around there would hold. It didn't hold exactly, and I had talked about the um, the low, but I, it was roughly within, like a, I believe, a dollar or so of the low in oil. So close enough for me. Anyhow, um, that said, I do think that you could kind of buy the dips in this as long as um, it stays in the uptrend. The pattern here seems to be shifting from lower lows and lower highs to now higher highs and higher lows. I don't know that I would chase it right here. You're coming into a gap. It may have, it, it, it will likely fill the gap, but you're now multiple days up and it's starting to get extended. You have a 200 day moving average um, coming down from 2398. So I think actually up there should be a decent right or right out short for a pullback. And then I would be looking to buy the dips on trend. So that's my thinking with rig. And I guess I would say the oil stocks in general, um, CL, I've, I've heard um, Goldman Sachs came out the other day. 
I'm just looking at some of the comments. So Tesla, um, I didn't like the price action in Tesla today, but I think as long as oil is rising, you can buy the dips in Tesla. Um, that's my theory with that stock. The, um, again, the IV in that isn't very high. It's rather on the low side. So I would say you could probably do that with some type of call spreads on dips. Um, or sell puts into some type of a steeper down move. You don't want to do it on up moves. So oil. Goldman Sachs, who has been wrong on oil um, pretty much always lately. They um, were upgrading it at 110, and now they were downgrading it down in the at the lows. Uh, there's, believe it or not, a lot of room to run in oil. Uh, there is some, some resistance coming up around between 60, let's see, what was the low here? 63, I really see the, I'm really using the fib, fib retracements, so I'm going to cheat a little bit with the fib retracements. So the 38.2 fib retracement is 67.34, but the one that I'm really watching where oil really broke down from was 75 bucks. That's the 50% retracement, and, and frankly, that's really where I think oil's going. I think it's going to 75 bucks. Um, the 200 declining moving day, the 200 moving day average is declining. That's roughly around that 38.2 fib fib uh, retracement. But I do think that oil is going to fill that sort of vacuumous cascade down. I don't know that it's going to get much higher than that. Although the 61.8 is 82.75. The um, Let's just stick with 75 for now. We'll reevaluate when we get there. But I do think at some point oil will get back there. I don't think it's going to be a straight line. Um, I do think that there could be some sort of down moves. I would say that the thesis for higher in oil is valid as long as we hold over 54.24. If oil gets back below there, I would say that it's going to retest the lows and that it's probably going to make fresh lows. So I would say that that is my, my thesis, that oil is by the dip as long as it holds over 54.24. If it gets below there, you know, GTFO and be a little bit more cautious. Uh, that would tell me, if that does happen, I will start warming up to the theory of recession. I would say that that is, um, that is why it would be happening. Um, that's, that would be my thesis at that point. If we start getting below there and we start hovering that low again, that there could be some recession talk. And you, you heard it here first. That's what you'll start hearing on TV. I almost assure you. Uh, are there any other questions? Is there anything anyone um, is interested in talking about stock-wise? Want to talk about Apple? Anyone interested in hearing what I think about Apple? Um, Chesapeake, someone asked me about. This is going to be similar type of analysis. Resistance support level on first 15 minute of a chart. Not sure if you spoke about Facebook and yes, Apple. Yes, I did talk about Facebook. Um, I'm going to post this again, this video on YouTube for anyone who came late, so you could go back and sort of fast forward through it. So, Chesap let's do Chesapeake quickly. This was a stock that the CEO was sort of a bit of a, a wild man, that Aubrey McClendon. I think he was very competent in his industry, but I think he was very incompetent with how he handled his company and his finances. And I think that that's led to a lot of problems in the stock. It's had a lot of relative weakness, and it sort of retested up to where the breakdown level was, the uh, 16s. I would say you probably can, I hate to say this, safely own the stock on down moves. I, I don't know how much lower it's going to go. You know, I, honestly, I have to punt a little bit on Chesapeake. It's not one I really follow. Uh, it's been in a protracted down move and a, de and a decline. It's, it's sort of just meandering. I would, um, I would wait for the pattern to shift. This is really just a mucky pattern down here. You were starting to make higher highs, and then the lows now are a little bit lower. It's sort of in a, I hate to say megaphone pattern, but... It's sort of at the lows. I mean, I would say it's probably more of a buy down here in the lower end of the range than a sell. Um, unless you think it's going to be a zero, which I don't think. So Tesla. Somebody had asked me about Tesla a little while ago. Um, all right, so my thinking about Tesla, like I said, that I, it was a bit of a weird uh, response on earnings. It, uh, it initially was up, then it went down. I had cautioned on that in the after hours that I said that if it couldn't hold the 225 to 226, that I thought it was going to go down to retest that 220-ish area, and it did to the tick, and it held. 
So it now came up and broke over the highs. It also is back over the 238.75. So as long as you're over 238.75, I think it's by the dips. If you get below there, it starts getting a little bit more iffy to me. You are, though, however, coming into some resistance. Like this 245 to 249 area was a bit of resistance. And the full gap fill was 257.70. If you recall last summer, um, roughly around the Hamptons Classic at the end of the summer, is when Tesla peaked. It tends to do well in the summer. So seasonally, Tesla has got that going for it. That said, it's moved up real lot from the lows. I think it would be, it's tough to chase here. I like it for buy the dips, but not to chase the rips. So let's talk about Apple. That seems to be, that and Priceline, oddly, um, are, are stocks people love. So my story with Apple is this, is if, any, if you've watched my videos, I don't know if you're new to me and my stream, but if you've watched my videos, I've been fairly consistently right on Apple. Um, not to you know, brag or to toot my own horn or whatever, but it, it's just the analysis has worked, so let's just stick with it. So I, I see Apple, I, I, every time it, it sort of has run on earnings and then it's, 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 it's gone and then it's just consolidated in like a box. And the difference this time was that it didn't break out on earnings and now it's back into the middle of the box. So, and has a lot of relative, I would say relative weakness. Although it's, it's probably not as weak as it should be just because you've got guys like Carl Icahn and stuff in there. So my theory with Apple and the levels that I'm watching, the most important one, and I know a lot of people aren't talking about this except for me, is 129.85. That was the high Apple had reached in the pre-market when it was added to the Dow Jones Industrial Average. What better news can you get than being added to the Dow? So, excuse me, anything below there, and I think the stock is still a little bit vulnerable. Uh, in the interim time, the 50-day moving average had been very important to the stock recently, and the more you close below it, it starts getting a little iffy. I would be looking for a shift in Apple, like if you want to buy the stock. First of all, the IV is very low in there. It's like 23%. 25 to 26 is like the average. So if you want to play Apple, the best way to do it is just to buy calls. That's what I would do. Um, I think that you can do that, or you can just buy puts to hedge stock outright. Um, and if the stock does come down, then when the IV jumps, you can sell out of the money puts to have financed the ones that you had purchased and use that so it doesn't cost you very much. And if, it, um, if the stock goes higher, hey, you didn't pay, pay a lot for that protection. But I need to start seeing Apple do, do what I always call making higher lows and then higher highs. A lot of people on the stream are gamblers and they like to bet on tops and they like to bet on bottoms. I like to kind of catch the meat of the move, that 80% in between the 220s or the, or, you know, the 85, what, what have you. I like to catch the, um, the, extre you know, the, 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 the meat of the move, basically. I don't like to catch the first 10%, the last 10%, but I like the 80%. If I can catch the last 10%, though, that is, um, that's nice. Although I often am out slightly ahead of time. So Apple has been making lower lows and lower highs. You want to see that pattern reverse. It's also below the 50 and the 20 day moving averages as of today's close. Yesterday it failed at the 50. Today it tried to be above there, failed just above there, and it came back down. Um, one thing I don't want to get too into here is doing too much of this on every stock. That's what I, 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 for my weekend videos, I prefer to do these types of more types of analysis because you're not able to see the chart that I'm looking at. Only I can see that. And I think it doesn't benefit you as much when you can't see it as much as the weekend video. The, the Periscope, I think, is really better for talking bigger picture, more fundamental questions of like risk management or of the market or of my views on certain things that I can kind of elaborate on more on this than I can maybe in the weekend video. But we'll finish Apple and then we'll maybe we'll get to some more of that type of stuff. Anyhow, anything below 127.62 here is um, a little bit suspect to me. That was the last swing high. You really need to see it take that. Um, that was also a stall at the 20-day moving average, by the way. Um, if there's anything else that you guys want to talk about, maybe that's not as technically specific, that would be, um, I think that would be really beneficial. If not, we could kind of uh, wrap. I think we did cover a lot of stuff here.
I'm not seeing any responses. Maybe there's just a lag. Sometimes there's still a lag in Periscope. It's a little bit of glitchy technology. Um, how about selling iron condors and collecting premiums? Sure, why not? Um, I think that iron condors are okay. I think that it's probably better in a bit of a higher implied volatility environment, just so you can get your um, you could get more juice and more and maybe further you can well, I guess with the iron condors you're not really looking for further width unless you're doing broken wing flies but that wasn't the question uh, iron wing condors are okay I have no problem with that I, I I think that that's good in stocks that are sort of in a choppy range like for example I think a LinkedIn would be a good stock to do iron condors in here because it just seems to be chopping and going sideways you want to do that in stocks that you don't think are going anywhere the, or you could do it on some indices. You know, the SPY has been in a pretty defined range, so maybe like mid-range you want to put it on or, you know, peel it on and off at the, at the extremes. So I think we could wrap there. We covered a lot of stuff. Anyhow, um, I appreciate you guys tuning in. I, um, I, if you're not following me, follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Justin Pulitzer. And be sure to f subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's um, Justin Pulitzer Trades. And we'll have a good week. Cheers.